Our main character, known as the Baskerville family's hound, Vikir von Baskerville, had faced a terrible fate. Wrongly accused and sentenced to death by guillotine, he had been loyal to his family. As he stood there, moments away from the cold, unforgiving blade, he vowed that if he ever got a second chance at life, he wouldn't be a hound again. But now, as he opened his eyes, Vakir found himself in a strange and unsettling place. His body felt heavy, and the surroundings were completely unfamiliar. He couldn't help but wonder if he had ended up in hell. In this eerie setting within the grand estate of the Baskerville family, babies were scattered throughout the room, crying and making all sorts of noises. A man entered, the patriarch of the family, and he commented callously that these babies were insignificant, referring to them as trash. As the man strolled through the room, he noticed that one baby, Vikir, remained strangely silent compared to the others. He ordered the servants to bring the babies to a strange cradle-like contraption, and they obeyed without question. Vikir, who had once been known as Vikir, recognized this man as the main culprit behind his previous life's death, Hugo Labaskerville. Seeing Hugo's younger self, Vikir couldn't help but think back to his own past life as a hound. Born into an illegitimate family, Vakir had been raised in a harsh environment where hounds were trained to carry out missions that included assassination, intelligence, ambushes, and other dark tasks. Hounds were essentially the ones who took care of the dirty work so that the Baskervilles could maintain their position as the most powerful among the seven families. Vakir had remained loyal to the Baskervilles because he desperately wanted their acknowledgement. But ten years after the demons had been defeated and the gates to the demonic world had been closed, the reward for Vakir's loyalty had been his own execution. He knew too much. Clenching his tiny fists in his new baby body, Vakir swore he would never live that life again. He wanted revenge, but in his fragile baby state, he was helpless. Frustration bubbled up within him as he rolled around angrily. Then it hit him. To become strong, he needed to seize the opportunity offered by the Cradle of Swords. This trial, mandatory for every Baskerville child, involved navigating a maze to reach the Styx River. The legendary river had the power to turn children's bodies into iron but its effects were limited to a select number of children. Vakir remembered the fastest route to the river, a straight path out of the helix-shaped wall of blades. He crawled past the swords, determined to change his fate this time. Men watched as Vakir dunked himself into the Styx River, determined to keep the power it offered all to himself for as long as possible. The MC began to sink deeper into the river, feeling the icy water seeping into his wounds. Despite the pain, being in the water had its advantages. He covered his mouth to endure, determined to stay below as long as he could. Amidst the swirling currents, two servants on the riverbank shouted for the MC to resurface. Hugo, watching the scene unfold, simply laughed. Curious about the passage of time, he turned to Barrymore, the head butler, and inquired how much time had passed. Barrymore informed him that approximately seven minutes had gone by, to which Hugo found amusement, suggesting that the MC might not survive. Hugo called out to the struggling MC urging him to come out of the water. Ignoring Hugo's calls, the MC continued to absorb the river's power with all his might. He lost control, his eyes turning white as he endured excruciating pain before finally blacking out. Hugo, holding the MC by the foot, remarked that staying in the river had been enough for the baby, even hinting that he had drunk its water. Hugo then noticed that the MC had already grown teeth. Curious about the child's name, Hugo asked Barrymore, who revealed it was Vikir. With a smile, Hugo proclaimed the MC's name, signifying the birth of a very ambitious son, eager for revenge and determined to make the Baskerville family vanish into history. As Vakir grew older, he was known as a genius by the age of eight, although his family considered him normal. At 20, he undertook missions involving assassination, espionage, and conquest. By the time he reached 29, he realized the limits of his swordsmanship compared to the family's direct lineage. At 30, the demonic realm gate opened, marking the start of the demon's clan invasion. Over the years, he endured the era of destruction, bravely battling and slaying countless monsters. At 39, the war finally came to an end, with humanity emerging victorious. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. What type of bending, water bending, etc. is the best? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now back to the recap. At 40 years old, Vakir was finally rewarded for his loyalty. The reward is defamation, false accusation, the guillotine's blade. In a dimly lit room, Vakir opens his eyes, gazing at a ceiling decorated with playful, colorful stars. He realizes it's a nursery and his heart races with excitement. This meant he had absorbed the power of the Styx River. His eyes gleam with triumph. A servant tiptoes in, her footsteps soft against the wooden floor. She places a mysterious box in a crib, whispering in confusion. Why would the madam give such a thing? Vakir, curious and cautious, 
watches the box open. A chill runs down his spine as a dark, sinuous figure emerges. It's two vipers, known as the Bloody Mamba. His mind races, understanding this is a deadly gift from the madam. Few in the family earned that title, and her intentions were always cloaked in mystery. The vipers hiss menacingly, but Fakir's reaction is swift and fearless. He grabs them, his eyes wide with a mix of thrill and vengeance. He feels like a hunter confronting his prey, Determined to bring down the Baskervilles, the family he despises. As he strangles the vipers, his hands stained with their blood, he imagines toppling the family with these same hands. The next morning, the nursery is a shocking scene. The crib is stained with blood, and the dead vipers lay around. In the midst of this chaos, Vakir sleeps peacefully, a stark contrast to the violence around him. The servants are horrified, and blame falls on the nannies. They face a grim fate, yet the true reason behind the viper attack remains a mystery to everyone but Vikir. Eight years later, Vikir sits in a classroom, the teacher's voice echoing around him. He talks about swordsmanship levels, from beginners to experts, and then to swordmasters like Sir Hugo of the Baskervilles. The children listen in awe, but Vikir is deep in thought. He needs to regain his strength from his past life before his coming-of-age ceremony. The teacher notices Vikir's distraction, but also his potential. He comments on Vikir's extraordinary abilities, his quick learning, and his physical strength from surviving the Styx River. The teacher knows the Patriarch will be pleased with such talent. As Vikir pondered the challenge of confronting Hugo, the notorious Baskerville Trident triplets, high, middle, and low, fixed their gaze on him. They shoved Makir, tauntingly calling him Garbage Van. These triplets were notorious in the Baskerville household, and they had heard all about Vakir's miraculous seven minutes in the Styx River and his infant encounter with deadly vipers. Their curiosity mixed with disdain drew them to him. Vakir, maintaining his composure, remembered these three vividly. In his previous life, they were the traitors who had stabbed him amidst his escape from false accusations. Now, in this life, they confronted him, driven by envy and skepticism. They provocatively demanded Vakir to stop his alleged lies, expressing their dislike openly. Vakir, foreseeing trouble with them in the future, decided it was time to establish his dominance. High, emboldened and sneering, held a knife to Vakir, challenging his rumored invulnerability. They wanted to test if his extended exposure to the Styx River had indeed made his body impervious to blades. Low, with a sinister grin, covered Vakir's mouth, threatening to eat his hand if Vakir could endure for three minutes without breathing. Vakir, understanding their malicious intent, played along, biding his time. As the first minute passed, High and Middle started doubting the rumors of Vakir's supernatural resilience. But as three minutes turned into ten, their doubt transformed into stunned silence. They hadn't expected Vakir to withstand such a test so effortlessly. When they finally released him, a jarring crunch echoed through the room. Lo screamed, his hand bleeding profusely. Vakir, his face smeared with blood, grinned malevolently, reminding them of their earlier vow. Middle and Low stood frozen, terror-stricken, while High was forced to confront the reality of Vakir's rumored powers. In a frantic attempt to regain control, High lunged at Vakir, stabbing him in the stomach. To his dismay, the knife failed to penetrate. Vakir, with an air of superiority, reminded them that in the Baskerville clan, age was insignificant compared to power and talent. With a swift motion, Vakir twisted High's hand, his eyes gleaming with a predatory intensity. He dared them to prolong their twisted game. High, writhing in agony, conceded the truth of the rumors. Just before Vakir's fist met his face in a brutal punch, Middle tried to step in, but Vakir effortlessly kicked him aside, his strength and agility on full display. High lay on the ground, his face a mess of broken teeth and a bleeding nose, while Middle and Low stood in utter shock, realizing they had grossly underestimated Vakir's formidable power and resilience. Get wrecked, son. Low, his face a mask of shock and disbelief, stumbled to the ground, grappling with the reality of their situation. Victor, with a calm yet ominous tone, reassured him that his wounds would heal soon enough with proper treatment. However, he issued a stern warning as he picked up the knife from the floor. He declared that none of them would leave the room, insisting that they had to endure the pain and discomfort of their own making. As he brandished the knife, Vakir offered a chilling proposition. He gave them a choice. One of them could leave the room. The brothers, clutching their wounds, looked at each other in desperation. The knife was tossed among them, and Vakir's voice echoed urging them to decide quickly among themselves. With blood-red eyes and a menacing grin, Vakir's voice lingered in the air as he exited the room, expressing his impatience and a hint of twisted excitement. He suggested, almost mockingly, that at least one of them should survive. As the door closed behind Vakir, the triplets were left in a state of shock, but soon their desperation turned into aggression. Sounds of fighting and yelling erupted from behind the door, a cacophony of chaos as Vakir stood outside, 
listening with a satisfied smile. The united front of the Trident of Baskerville was crumbling. Meanwhile, Barrymore reported to Hugo about another bloody incident involving the Moore clan and the Ruby Mines. Hugo saw an opportunity for future negotiations, but his attention was quickly diverted to a new report. Vakir had topped the written exam. Hugo smiled with satisfaction, inquiring about the upcoming practical exam. Barrymore informed him that the Guardian Knights had departed to prepare, leaving the fortress vacant. He then detailed the gruesome aftermath of the fight between the young masters. High had lost all his teeth, Middle's jaw was shattered, and Lou's left index finger was amputated. Though they had physically recovered, their mental states were deeply affected. Hugo was taken aback by the news of the triplets infighting as they had always been close. Barrymore revealed Vakir's involvement, causing Hugo to become deeply concerned. In the next scene, Vakir stood before Hugo and Barrymore, respectfully addressing Hugo as the patriarch. Hugo, addressing Vakir, expressed his intrigue, and perhaps a hint of admiration at how Vakir had single-handedly dismantled the unity of the triplets. Vakir responded, his voice steady and unapologetic, confirming that the triplets had indeed received proper medical care. Hugo, reflecting on their current state, noted that their hearts were disabled. The triplets, once inseparable, no longer ate or spoke together, their famed combination technique effectively destroyed. A faint smile played on Vakir's lips, a silent testament to his handiwork. Hugo, probing deeper, questioned whether it was wrong for Vakir to have reduced his brothers to such a state. Vakir's reply was simple yet profound. He was merely stronger. He posed a philosophical question, wondering if the stronger person is ever in the wrong. Hugo, intrigued by this perspective, shared a personal anecdote. He recalled how the youngest daughter of a family ruined by the Baskervilles had paid him a visit. She had become a nun and offered him forgiveness. As Vakir echoed Hugo's thoughts on forgiveness, his eyes glowed a deep red. He stated that forgiveness was merely an excuse for the weak, who lacked the strength to seek revenge. Hugo's face lit up with a wide smile, pleased with Vakir's understanding. He recited the family motto, Only the strong will reign supreme. Weakness is a sin. As a reward for his actions and insights, Hugo granted Vakir permission to take any snack from the food storage, limited only by what he could carry. Vakir's face brightened at the mention of chocolate, his favorite treat. He thanked Hugo respectfully for the reward, and as he turned to leave, Hugo called him son, expressing his expectations for Vikir in the upcoming interim evaluation. Although inwardly disgusted by Hugo's words, Vakir politely agreed. Barrymore then introduced Vakir to a renowned chocolate favored by the Morgue clan. It was a luxury item, difficult to obtain. However, Vakir declined the offered delicacy, requesting instead cacao beans with a rich aroma. The chefs and Barrymore were puzzled by this unusual request. They presented him with purple-colored cacao beans, known as bloody beans, each capable of producing a hundred liters of chocolate. Vakir tasted them and was taken aback by their bitter taste. Barrymore mused to himself, impressed by Vakir's unique approach to securing chocolate despite the patriarch's restrictions, believing it to be a testament to Vakir's brilliance and his deep love for chocolate. The chef, curious about Vakir's intentions with the beans, offered to process them. Vakir, however, declined and decided to take the beans as they were. Barrymore was left wondering about Vakir's peculiar tastes, but unbeknownst to him, Vakir had no intention of eating the beans. Instead, he planned to use them in the upcoming practical exam. Five days later, high up in the mountains, Vakir stood with a wide grin, anticipating a significant upheaval unprecedented in the clan's history. The children of the Baskerville family were subjected to rigorous training and education from a very young age. Learning to walk meant they had to run up steep mountains, and they were never allowed to lie down or rest on their stomachs. Their only sleep came with a monster corpse, conditioning them for harsh environments. This arduous journey culminated in their deadly evaluation at the age of eight. The practical evaluation was a survival exam. The young masters of the Baskerville family were gathered in a remote area of the mountain. Pavlov, the instructor, outlined the rules. Survive for a month while hunting large and strong monsters. Points were awarded based on survival, overcoming challenges, and defeating monsters, with additional points for stealing badges from others. Death resulted in zero points, and a perfect score of 100 points was unattainable. Pavlov reminded them of Hugo's lesson that a swordsman dies when they become arrogant. He warned them to stay within the designated area, as the mountain was full of undiscovered dangers. Shadow dogs were assigned to monitor and grade the candidates. As the exam was about to begin, whispers and rumors circulated among the candidates about Vakir. Many wondered how he would fare in the practical exam, given his notorious reputation. Vakir, overhearing these murmurs, smiled to himself, recalling his knowledge of the mountain terrain. The triplets, still nursing their wounds from their recent encounter, avoided any eye contact with him. The sound of Pavlov's bell, signaling the start of the exam, the young masters dispersed, each with their own strategy. The triplets, still bickering among themselves, 
were reminded that killing was discouraged, as it would lead to point deductions. Pavlov, smoking a cigarette, watched the proceedings, confident that the shadow dogs would minimize casualties. A shadow dog, tasked with observing Vikir, stealthily followed him, blending into the surroundings. The stage was set for a grueling test of survival, with Vikir ready to utilize his unique skills and cunning to outmaneuver his rivals. As the shadow dog followed Vikir, it was intrigued by his actions, anticipating a display of the skills that had earned him such a formidable reputation from a young age. Reaching a large tree with soft ground, Vikir decided it was the perfect spot to settle and take a break. The shadow dog, taken aback by his decision to rest so early in the exam, watched in disbelief as Vikir began gathering resources and building structures. It wondered if his strategy was simply to hide and avoid confrontation. After a while, Vikir left the site, with the shadow dog noting his departure. Vikir reminisced about a past lesson where he learned that cacao beans, especially the bloody beans, could make fish less smelly. Staring into the flames, he finished his preparations and decided it was time to start hunting. Around him, pits of spears were strategically placed, a testament to his survival skills. A few days passed, and Viker ventured into the restricted area. As a former scout, he was familiar with this terrain. He detected a burning smell and discovered burning excrement, a unique characteristic of a specific monster in the area, a hellhound. The hellhound, a beast that had consumed the hellfires of the other world, was a formidable creature with a body engulfed in flames. Vakir had barely managed to defeat one at the age of 18 in his past life. Now, at only eight years old, defeating it seemed impossible. However, he remembered a crucial weakness from his past experiences. Dashing towards the Hellhound, Vakir exploited its limited mobility, as it could only move in straight lines, making it difficult for the creature to change direction. The Hellhound was stunned when Vakir effortlessly dodged its attack. Vakir then sprayed water across the ground, exploiting another vulnerability of the Hellhound, its inability to cross water. As the Hellhound avoided the water, it inadvertently exposed another common canine weakness, opening its mouth while running. Vikir, anticipating this, took a step back just as the Hellhound lunged at him, its mouth wide open. The moment Vikir had been waiting for had arrived. With a casual flick, he tossed something into the Hellhound's mouth, deftly dodging the creature as it attempted to circle back towards him. However, the Hellhound began to feel that something was terribly wrong and stumbled to the ground, whimpering in pain. The revelation came from Vakir. The chocolate he had given to the Hellhound was poison to canines. Since one bloody bean could produce 100 liters of chocolate, it was the ultimate poison for the Hellhound. Helpless and writhing in pain, the Hellhound lay on the ground, unable to move. Vakir approached the incapacitated beast, drawing his sword and carefully selecting a target area without ribs to target its kidney. The hellhound whimpered in agony as the sword pierced its body. As Vakir delivered the final blow, a blue essence emerged from the hellhound's body. It was called XP, or Karma, a substance formed when monsters were captured after energy had accumulated in their bodies, making them stronger. Vakir absorbed it, feeling the short sword he wielded becoming lighter. With a sense of accomplishment, Vakir knew he would be able to catch up to his regression state before reaching adulthood. He couldn't help but wonder about Hugo's reaction when he found out that an eight-year-old had brought back a monster with a B-plus rating. With this monster, Vakir secured the first place in the practical test and had already decided on his reward, a book whose true worth only he knew. As Vakir proceeded to decapitate the hellhound's head, he suddenly sensed a presence behind him. Turning, he saw four more hellhounds. He speculated that they had come because of their comrade's cries, possibly seeking revenge. Excited at the prospect of facing more hellhounds, Vakir readied himself, knowing he still had more poison beans at his disposal. However, an even larger presence loomed over the hellhounds. Vakita noticed it first, and believed that the hellhounds were cowering in fear due to Vikir's bloodthirst. Hellhounds were known never to submit, even if they faced certain death. Vikio, intrigued by this development, turned around and beheld a three-headed figure, a Cerberus. The sight of the Cerberus alarmed Vikir, as it had a rating of A+, far higher than it should have been at this stage. He wondered why it had appeared here, and why it was injured, with wounds and blood dripping from its body. Upon closer examination, Vakir deduced that it had been chased and injured by the barbarian tribes across the mountain as it had entered their territory. The situation had taken an unexpected turn, and Vikir prepared himself for a challenging battle against the formidable Cerberus. Vakir recognized that this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to hunt an injured A-plus rated beast and he was determined to seize it. He couldn't afford to let the Cerberus escape, no matter the cost. Despite hiding his true power, Vakir had already mastered the third basketball technique and had achieved a high level as a sword expert. In fact, he had reached a level of mastery that most hounds only achieved when they became adults. 
With his blade covered in aura, the Kyr dashed towards the injured Cerberus, intent on slicing one of its heads. However, the Cerberus swiftly reacted, interfering with his attack. In the heat of the moment, Fakir managed to slice one of the Cerberus' heads, realizing that killing it was indeed possible. His swordsmanship was polished, and every technique was executed with precision and efficiency, thanks to his strength and body from the river sticks. However, reality struck hard as the Cerberus landed a devastating blow on Fakir, shattering his sword into pieces. Fakir momentarily let his guard down, resulting in a lethal claw strike from the Cerberus that sent him flying into a nearby tree. Coughing up blood, his vision went white from the impact. As he slowly regained consciousness, Fakir was surprised to find that his left arm was still intact, despite the excruciating pain. He attributed this to the effects of the river sticks. The Cerberus prepared for another attack, dashing toward him and smashing the tree to bits. Fakir leaped out of harm's way, realizing that even though his arm was intact, the damage remained and he couldn't afford to take another hit. With the odds stacked against him, Fakir considered the situation as a test that every experienced hunter must face. He thought carefully about his next move and decided that the best course of action was to simply run away as fast as possible. The Cerberus was taken aback by his sudden retreat and chased after him. Vakir counted his lucky stars that the Cerberus was injured, otherwise he would have been torn apart by now. As Vakir continued to sprint away from the relentless Cerberus, his sole focus was reaching a specific location he had prepared in advance. His life depended on making it past the iron fence that marked the boundary of the restricted area. With every ounce of strength, he leaped over the iron fence, preparing himself for what lay ahead. The Cerberus was in hot pursuit, roaring loudly as it reached the iron fence, tearing it apart with its powerful jaws. The stakes were high. If Fakir was caught before reaching his prepared spot, it could spell the end for him. He dashed through the dense trees, scanning the surroundings for the pile of wood he had marked as his destination. Spotting it just ahead of a tree, he pushed his body to its limits, screaming in his mind that he was almost there. As the Cerberus closed in, Fakir knew this was the perfect moment. With the beast's jaws wide open, ready to strike, he leaped into the air. A single step forward onto a hidden marking caused it to sink into the ground. The moment Vakir landed safely on his back, the Cerberus was met with a barrage of hidden spears that had been strategically placed in the ground. It was as if it had fallen into a deadly cradle. Breathing heavily, Vakir wiped the sweat from his face, relieved that the traps he had designed for hellhounds had proven effective against the Cerberus. The spears had been coated with bloody beans, the same species as the hellhounds. The Cerberus was poisoned, its two heads coughing, vomiting, and writhing in pain. The middle head, though in agony, noticed Vikir growling at it, holding a spear aimed directly at the beast. In a final act of defiance, the Cerberus threw the spear back at Vikir, but it only bounced harmlessly off its body. Vikir then began a countdown from seven, with each step the Cerberus took, marking a second passing. Slowly, the Cerberus closed the gap between them, Approaching Vakir, as the countdown reached zero, the Cerberus simply collapsed to the ground. Vakir let out a sigh of relief, knowing that the rumors about the seven steps were true. He explained that the spear he had thrown was different. It had been laced with the poison of the bloody Mamba's venom, an experience from his infancy. With the Cerberus defeated, Vakir absorbed its mana, confirming that it was truly dead this time. As Vakir stared at the Cerberus's corpse, he contemplated how to bring it back with him. However, he had another pressing matter to attend to. The presence of a Cerberus indicated the presence of a dungeon. With the gatekeeper now dead, the dungeon was free to be explored. Vakir covered himself in dried soil, rotten leaves, and moist roots, camouflaging his appearance. He backtracked the Cerberus's footprints, following them to a cave entrance. He entered the cave, knowing that it was supposed to remain undiscovered for a few more years. Deep within the cave, he could feel the mana energy beneath the surface, confirming that it had not been explored yet. The darkness within the cave seemed endless, with no source of light. Despite the darkness, Vakir was excited about the treasures that might be hidden within the dungeon. He continued to explore, noticing red veins of ruby minerals throughout the area, possibly connected to the Red All Mountain. Suddenly, he saw light up ahead, indicating the entrance to the dungeon. As he entered a large room, he saw a floating red stone at its center. The bright light emanating from the stone made him shield his eyes. Approaching the floating ruby, he noticed something behind it, a skeleton with a note. It was evident that someone had been here before him. Examining the skeleton, he saw injuries consistent with stabbings and dried blood stains. Picking up the note from the ground, he realized that a long time had passed for the skeleton. The note, written by a member of the basketball family who preferred to be called Kane, warned future generations not to make the same mistake he did. Kane explained that the stone chamber was a legend within the family, and he and his brother Abel had stumbled upon it during a raid on the dungeon killed many monsters and had eventually reached the chamber, where they found the final assignment. The assignment had bound them to the chamber for three long years. 
The Kier couldn't believe that they had endured for three years, indicating their determination to obtain the treasure. The note revealed that the final assignment was somewhere in the chamber. As Fakir examined the stand of the floating ruby, he saw an inscription. When entering, it's one, but once inside, it's two. When leaving, it's one. This riddle left him puzzled. The note continued with Cain and Abel contemplating the enigmatic text. They realized that as twins, they were once one in their mother's womb, but had become two upon birth. To obtain the treasure, they had to become one again, and only one of them could leave with the coveted prize. After a fierce battle, Cain killed his brother in the stone chamber, leaving only one of them alive. However, there was no change in the chamber, and the expected treasure did not appear. Cain was perplexed by the lack of a reward. Despite killing his own brother, he screamed in frustration and decided to leave, with the intention of warning others who might discover this place to stay away. He believed that the Devil's Den only existed to taunt humans. As Vakir reflected on Cain's story, he concluded that the brothers had misinterpreted the riddle. Since he had no twin, he believed that the answer to the riddle lay within the dungeon. He realized that the brothers had been unlucky due to being twins, and he had an idea. Vakir contemplated the riddle once more and realized that the answer lay in shadows. He explained that when he entered the dungeon, he was one, but as soon as the ruby's light cast a shadow, he became two. With this understanding, he smashed the ruby into pieces, plunging the chamber into darkness. This action triggered the opening of the final stage of the dungeon. The pieces of the shattered ruby began to rise and release energy, opening a passageway in front of Vakir. He smiled happily as the final stage revealed a sword, the relic of the Devil's Den. The sword was named Beelzebub and had an evil aura. It bore the inscription that only those with Baskerville's blood could wield it. Vakir was shocked to discover that the sword was Beelzebub, which was associated with the gluttonous fly Beelzebub, from old legends, the sword had been part of the Devil's holy constellation called the Seven Calamities, and had caused countless deaths when taken by the demon clans. With excitement, Vakir grabbed the sword, declaring that it would not cause such calamities again. The sword exuded a ferocious energy, and as he held it, it seemed to become a part of his arm. Vakir felt lucky to possess a blade from a Devil's holy constellation. As he prepared to leave the chamber, Vakir suddenly felt something wrong with his body. He stumbled to the ground, realizing that he was hungry. The blade, Beelzebub, made a noise, suggesting that it wanted to consume something. Following the sword's direction, he reached the corpse of the Hellhound he had killed earlier. Beelzebub extended a tube into the Hellhound's corpse, absorbing its blood. Vakir felt his body returning to normal as his hunger subsided. He hoped that the mountain's dried condition wasn't due to the sword's hunger. Beelzebub had absorbed the Hellhound's ability, which Vakir identified as hemorrhage. It seemed that Beelzebub could absorb its enemy's skills as its own although it had a limit of three skills for now. After absorbing the abilities of the Hellhound and the Sewer Rat, Vakir discovered the Hellhound's skill, which constantly pumped out the blood of its opponent, even through the smallest wounds. Realizing his newfound ability to steal skills, Vakir looked at the Cerberus corpse and noticed Beelzebub's excitement at the thought of feeding on it. However, Vakir warned Beelzebub that it couldn't eat all of it due to the Cerberus being too damaged. He thought silently about how to explain this during the autopsy. Beelzebub, eager to consume, made constant noises, but Vakir slapped it, indicating that it had consumed enough. Beelzebub was upset, but had gained two new skills, including the power of the sewer rat beneath the Cerberus. Vakir picked up the rat, pleased with the many powerful skills he had absorbed. Afterward, Vakir decided to wait at the practical exam site, having finished preparing the monster. The young hounds had gathered, each covered in various injuries from their hunts. They would receive rewards such as shields, swords, or necklaces, based on the parts they had produced from the monsters they hunted during the practical exam. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out at Curtis Vaughn 3578 who commented, can we please get more parts on our useless school life video? Thanks for commenting. As the monster parts were laid on the table, the senior members were astonished at what Vakir had hunted. Hugo, upon hearing the news, was alarmed and questioned Barrymore about the details. Barrymore reported that Vakir had accidentally crossed over to the restricted area during the exam and had hunted a wounded Cerberus, applying poison to his wooden spear. Hugo was curious about the poison that could kill a Cerberus and where Vakir had obtained it. Barrymore mentioned that the report lacked such details and wanted to ask Vakir directly. However, Vakir had returned to the dorm. Exhausted from the hunt, Hugo complimented Vakir for his resourcefulness and stated that information was power and power determined one's worth. Barrymore was surprised by Hugo's lack of discrimination based on bloodline and pondered whether Hugo was thinking of his second son, who was preparing for isolation training. When Vakir was summoned, he stood before Hugo and Barrymore with a smile on his face. 
Hugo questioned him about how he had caught the Cerberus during the exam. Fakir explained that he had placed chocolate on his wooden spear, which was lethal to canine monsters. Hugo inquired if that was the reason he had asked for chocolate before, to which Fakir confirmed. Barrymore couldn't help but wonder if this was how fathers and sons typically conversed. Hugo further asked why Fakir hadn't responded when the butler had questioned him about the hunt. Fakir replied that his master was the master of the clan. Hugo was satisfied with the response and rewarded Vakir with the monster's corpse and granted him a wish. Vakir wished for access to the 10,000 Epistle Library, which was one of the largest libraries in the Empire, located deep within the heart of the Baskerville clan. Hugo was surprised as only the Patriarch, the second in command, and their direct descendants were allowed to enter. However, Hugo granted him access, and Vakir asked to read the sixth technique of the family located within the sixth restricted zone. Hugo granted him permission, and Vakir was stunned by the opportunity to learn a technique that even illegitimate children were not allowed to. He recalled Hugo's current level at the seventh technique and his past life's discrimination. Vakir vowed to surpass Hugo in this life and obtain the greatest essence of basketball, a textbook containing the teachings of the first patriarch who had subjugated the seven great disasters. Hugo looked forward to Vakir's progress and wished him luck, to which Vakir bowed his head in gratitude, promising to surpass Hugo's expectations. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps. Two imposing guards stood sentinel in front of a grandiose door, guarding the entrance to a room that held the coveted library. Fakir, with a sense of anticipation, made his way towards the chamber, leading the way as he had never done before. Once inside, he paused, reflecting on the significance of this visit. It marked his first time setting foot in this hallowed space in person. As he perused the vast collection of books, he recognized the titles that had long eluded him treasure trove of knowledge he had yearned to acquire in his previous life. He understood that these advanced techniques were reserved for those considered legitimate heirs, a safeguard against any potential betrayal or threat to their master. The Baskerville family had devised this system, locking away valuable knowledge behind chains and barriers. Fakir couldn't help but wonder if the book before him was the one he had sought for so long. In his hand, he held a key, a gift from Hugo, an unexpected opportunity to delve into the secrets of the sixth technique a privilege he had never been granted in his past life. With cautious anticipation, Fakir inserted the key into the lock, a silent question lingering in his mind. Did Hugo doubt his ability to master the technique in a single day? As the pages revealed their secrets, Fakir's thoughts turned to the past. He had memorized the theories behind the first four techniques exhaustively, hoping to decipher the elusive fifth technique, a task that seemed to require halting the flow of mana after drawing the fourth tooth. In the realm of Baskerville swordsmanship, each tooth represented a specific technique, with red sword energy manifesting upon drawing a tooth. Fakir continued to flip through the pages, his indifference towards the sixth technique apparent. He had come here for a different purpose. Exiting the library, Fakir returned to the guards who were taken aback by his swift return. They inquired if he had forgotten something outside, offering to retrieve it for him. They also mentioned the existence of more books on swordsmanship deep within the library's recesses. Fakir politely declined their assistance, stating that he had accomplished what he had set out to do. The guard, perhaps out of curiosity, asked if he wished to stay longer, hinting at the hidden treasures that lay undiscovered. However, Vakir had other plans, expressing his desire to explore different volumes. He urged them to carry out their duties while he continued his quest for knowledge. As Vikir ascended the spiral staircase to the next floor, the guards exchanged whispers, puzzled by his apparent disinterest in the library's riches. They speculated about the value of the books in the miscellaneous section he was headed to, but Vikir paid them no mind. He knew that they underestimated the true worth of those books. Upon reaching the next floor, Vikir's discerning eyes landed on a particular book, one that stood out amidst the eclectic collection. Vikir's elation was palpable as he finally laid his hands on the coveted book titled The Lurking Ambush. He couldn't contain his excitement as he eagerly opened it, only to be met with disappointment. A ripped page rendered the book seemingly useless, relegating it to the status of a mere miscellaneous item. However, Vakir couldn't help but grin widely, for he alone knew the book's true worth, a memory from his pre-regression days resurfacing. In that distant past, Vakir had been part of a squad that had stumbled upon a peculiar relic within a dungeon located on the border of the Laruji Tylon War Mountains. This relic contained a single torn page from a Baskerville swordsmanship book, bearing the unmistakable handwriting of the Baskerville clan. To Hugo's amazement, who led the squad, he ordered everyone to scour the entire library in search of the book that matched the page, a task that proved to be daunting until they found the lurking ambush. The book held the coveted 10th technique, a precious treasure penned by their ancestors. 
Hugo had become consumed by the desire to unlock its secrets, and had even resorted to sending hounds to the seven great families, declaring war on them to retrieve the remaining six pages of the technique. This relentless pursuit had come at a great cost, with many hounds sacrificed, ultimately leading to Vakir providing all the pages. The reward for his efforts had been the death of Vaku, a memory that still fueled Vakir's anger. As Vakir held the book in his hands, he was determined to ensure that history did not repeat itself. He had given Hugo all the pages in their previous lives, and this time, he wouldn't allow the same fate to befall him. He knew that the reason he couldn't progress beyond the fourth technique was his lack of access to the original book. With a sense of purpose, Vikir began reading the book, realizing that without the other pages, it made little sense. However, he remained resolute, knowing that once he possessed all the pages, the book would transform into a masterpiece of swordsmanship. Reminding himself of his past strengths and the urgency of his mission, Vikir delved deep into the book's contents. Night turned to day as he immersed himself in its teachings, his determination unwavering. Finally, when he closed the book, it seemed as if he had read for an entire day, but this dedication had allowed him to memorize every detail from start to finish. Looking around, Vakir sensed that the Guardian Knights were nowhere in sight. He closed his eyes, envisioning a phantom figure before him. His arm began to glow with a red aura as he opened his eyes and struck out with the first technique. The strikes continued, seamlessly transitioning from one technique to the next. Amidst his focused training, Vakir couldn't help but grit his teeth, reflecting on his past self's inadequacies. He had worked tirelessly to attain the highest level of Graduator Aura, but had found himself unsuited to mastering proper sword techniques, leading the direct bloodline to become hostile toward him. Determined to rewrite his destiny, Vikir pressed on, knowing that he needed to regain the power he once possessed before his regression. The primary reason for Vikir's past struggles had been his status as an illegitimate child. Fueled by determination, he dashed to the side of the imaginary figure, challenging its belief that he would follow the same path again. As he approached the figure, it transformed into the older version of Hugo, the man who had once been his mentor. Vakir sliced relentlessly through the phantom Hugo, his strikes filled with determination. Exiting the imaginary space, he was left breathless, examining his hand, still questioning his strength and whether he had truly drawn out the elusive fifth tooth. He clenched both fists in victory, proud of the feat he had just accomplished. Overwhelmed with happiness, he was on the verge of tears. His determination led him to scan his surroundings, searching for a sword nearby to test the fifth technique once more. He realized that he had made history, as the young hound's canine teeth that had once bared toward his master had finally succeeded in drawing the fifth tooth. Vakir believed he could reach the level he once held, as long as his mana could support it. A red liquid aura enveloped his hand, signifying his advancement from a high-class sword expert to a low-class graduator. It was a feat that had taken him 30 years to achieve, but he had reached it at the tender age of eight. Graduators were on an entirely different level compared to sword experts, as their aura transitioned from solid to liquid, granting them increased density and flexibility. With his improved swordsmanship and the prospect of reaching the coveted 10th technique, Vakir saw endless possibilities. The farm technique he had learned before had its limitations, but the lurking ambush offered a perfect balance between offense and defense, with no growth restrictions. Vakir carefully placed the book near a window, contemplating the extent to which he should reveal his newfound strength to Hugo. Striking a balance was crucial, neither too much nor too little. He took out an object from his pocket and positioned it in front of the book, harnessing the sunlight to ignite a small fire on its pages. A sly grin played on Vakir's lips as he ensured that he was the sole possessor of the tenth technique this time. Just as the book began to burn, the Guardian Knights appeared behind him, inquiring about the unusual smell. They questioned Vikir, and he casually replied that he had accidentally left a magnifying glass around, leading to the book's destruction. The guards, relieved to hear that only a seemingly useless book had been damaged, agreed to keep the incident a secret. Vikir proposed moving on, pointing out more pressing matters to handle, and the guards readily concurred. Vikir left the scene with a smile, leaving the guards with newfound respect for his character. As he walked away, he appeared before Hugo and Barrymore once more. Hugo inquired if Vakir had reached enlightenment, to which he replied, Sort of. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. If you could control time, what would you do? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now, back to the recap. Hugo was intrigued by Vakir's cryptic description of what he had learned. Something warm, sharp, yet soft and viscous. Both Hugo and Barrymore were alarmed by this enigmatic statement. Barrymore ventured a guess, suggesting it might be related to Aura. Aura was typically something that only 15-year-olds could obtain after years of rigorous training. Hugo, while pondering why he was getting excited over an 8-year-old, 
asked Fakir to demonstrate what he had learned. Fakir agreed happily, and an arena was promptly prepared for the showcase. Many young masters gathered in the stands, confused and curious, as they watched Fakir standing there, armed with a sword. Barrymore inquired about Hugo's intentions for the demonstration. Hugo replied that a monster would be released to test Fakir's skills. The gates opened, revealing a massive orc, bound with chains all over its body. The creature growled menacingly, its red eyes glaring. Other young masters in the stands were taken aback, wondering if an eight-year-old could face an orc on his own. Vikir and the orc stood face to face. Hugo signaled to the Guardian Knights to remove the orc's chains. With a powerful roar, the orc lunged toward Vikir. The young prodigy, displaying a calm demeanor, swiftly swung his sword, cleanly slicing off the orc's arm with a single strike. The audience was stunned by the display of skill. The orc, bewildered by its injury, couldn't comprehend what had just happened. Without wasting a moment, Vakir dashed forward and, with another precise strike, severed the orc's leg, causing it to collapse to the ground. The orc remained perplexed, unable to fathom why it was bleeding for the first time, its regenerative abilities seemingly ineffective against Vakir's onslaught. It was the result of the bloodhound skill overpowering the orc's natural regenerative capabilities. People in the stands were left in awe, wondering how an eight-year-old could possess such incredible strength. Hugo watched with a deep sense of contemplation. Vikar turned to him, indicating that this was what he had learned in the library. Vikir then revealed Aura Blade, his sword enveloped in a strong red aura. The orc, attempting to rise, sensed a formidable presence and tried to react, but Vikir moved with lightning speed, smashing the orc's head into oblivion with a single dash, the aura enhancing his attack. Hugo sat in shock seeing the red aura emanating from the young prodigy. Barrymore, on the other hand, congratulated Hugo on witnessing the birth of a genius, suggesting that this level of talent was unlike anything they had seen from other families. However, Hugo couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss with the orc. He noticed that its blood wasn't stopping, even though orcs were renowned for their rapid regeneration. He tried to downplay Vakir's victory, attributing it to the orc's weakened state. Barrymore, puzzled by Hugo's demeanor, inquired if there was anything stronger that could challenge Vakir, his smile hinting at a deeper intrigue that surprised Hugo. Vakir couldn't help but relish the shocked expressions of the crowd as they contemplated his request for a stronger opponent than an orc. He understood that this was the right moment to demonstrate his newfound strength, hoping that it would eventually lead to his emancipation from Hugo's shadow. Hugo agreed with Vakir's request and ordered the release of a captive creature from the Barbarian Raid, a beast that had been starving since its capture. The crowd's astonishment grew as the massive troll stepped into the arena, growling menacingly at Vakir. With a confident smile, Vakir asked Hugo if he could begin immediately, to which Hugo granted his request. As the troll swung a mighty punch toward him, Vakir effortlessly dodged the attack. However, instead of immediately retaliating, Vakir decided to back away from the troll, confusing the onlookers. Hugo understood the strategy, recognizing the troll's regenerative powers and the need to exhaust it first. Vikir continued to dodge the troll's attacks, waiting for the moment to strike. The troll grew increasingly fatigued, and the crowd marveled at Vikir's tactical brilliance, praising the eight-year-old as a genius. Vikir knew he couldn't unleash his full power yet, as it would make things troublesome for him. Instead, he decided to turn the troll's power against itself. With a precise strike, he sliced the troll's arm, causing it to fall to the ground, clutching its bleeding shoulder. The crowd erupted in applause and admiration for Vikir's strategic prowess. However, Vikir realized that the first technique alone was insufficient to penetrate the troll's tough skin. Hugo, concerned for Vikir's safety, suggested he stop, but Vikir insisted he was almost finished. He felt an epiphany approaching, vowing to give up if he couldn't defeat the troll with the next attack. The troll, infuriated and desperate, released its red aura, preparing for a final assault. It charged at Vikir, yelling in rage, but then it realized something about him. In the next instant, a deadly aura image emanated from Vakir, and with a swift, masterful strike, Vakir cleaved the troll in half, unleashing the hound's aura. The entire arena fell into stunned silence as they witnessed this astounding feat. Vakir, even himself, shocked by what he had just accomplished, couldn't help but laugh in exhilaration, declaring that he had done it. Hugo, along with everyone in the arena, could hardly believe their eyes. A week later, Vakir found himself in the dining room, discontent with the food. He noticed that everyone had been avoiding him since his remarkable victory in the arena. However, he took solace in the astonishment displayed on Hugo's face, realizing that he had only revealed a fraction of his true power that day. In reality, he had become much more formidable. Vakir had also gained the super speed regeneration skill from the troll, 
which further enhanced his capabilities. As he pondered the changes within himself, he noticed the triplets appearing behind him. Vakir readied himself for whatever might come next. The triplets, noticing Vakir's astonishment, clarified that they didn't want anything from him other than to convey that they thought he was cool when he defeated the monsters. This unexpected compliment caused Vakir to spit out his food, skeptical about their intentions. Goosebumps crept up his skin as he couldn't shake the feeling that there might be some kind of scheme behind their words. Just as Vakir was grappling with this peculiar interaction, Butler Barrymore made his appearance, informing Vakir that he needed to go to the Patriarch's room. Meanwhile, back at the Baskerville family mansion, Hugo was engaged in a conversation with the Humor Clan Patriarch, Adolf Morg. They discussed the annual training event between the families and expressed their hope that no accidents would occur. Hugo downplayed a minor injury sustained by the mortgage children, referring to them as dramatic. Adolf mentioned that such behavior was typical of nobles, attributing it to their dignified stature. The Ryan Mage clan, the Morgs, and the Iron-Blooded Sword clan, the Baskervilles, were not always at odds. The Emperor had once remarked that magic and swords were a perfect combination leading to the tradition of annual joint training exercises as a gesture of goodwill between the two families. However, a dispute arose over a ruby mine situated in a region that both families claimed ownership of. Adolf inquired if the Baskervilles had a prodigious talent in their midst, but Hugo dismissed it as insignificant. This unexpected humility from Hugo surprised Adolf, prompting him to mention that the Morg family also had a genius. Adolf called in Camus, his sister's granddaughter, to meet Hugo. Camus remained silent instead of greeting Hugo and accused him of being a thief who had stolen the ruby mine. Hugo was infuriated by the accusation, and Adolf was taken aback. Camus explained that Hugo had used the term annoying chin beard during a carriage conversation, further angering Hugo. Adolf attempted to defuse the situation, calling it a misunderstanding, but Camus continued to demand the return of the rubies, explaining that she needed them for her research. Hugo, controlling his anger, acknowledged that she was just a child. Adolf held Camus tightly, fearing Hugo's reaction. He couldn't believe that Hugo would threaten an eight-year-old girl. Just then, Vikir entered the room, and Adolf wondered if he might be the supposed supernova. However, Camus was now missing from the room and reappeared in front of Vikir, demanding to know what he had said. Vikir recognized her as Camus Morg, the genius known as the Iron-Blooded Empress within the Morg clan. She had single-handedly eradicated monsters and barbarians in the Lone War Mountain, burning them to death on spears and creating a legendary reputation for herself. Vikir also remembered her captivating beauty. Camus insisted that the ruby mines belonged to her, not Vikir. Vikir, unfazed, replied that she had come a long way to throw a tantrum. Flames erupted from Camus at the mention of tantrum. Vikir expressed his eagerness to hear her explanation, causing a replica of ice to form in the room. Astonishing everyone, Camus explained that the ruby mine was situated in the joint security area between the Morg and Baskerville territories. The issue was that the entrance was in Morg territory, but the mine extended beneath the Baskerville land. Adolf was pleased with the explanation, but Hugo was visibly upset. Vikir added that the Baskervilles didn't need to mine the rubies, as they were primarily used for magical ingredients. However, he bluntly called Camus an idiot for thinking that anyone would willingly allow another to access their land for the sake of a few pennies. Hearing these words, Camus couldn't contain her anger. She pointed vehemently at the sculpture, indicating which side belonged to each family. With a sweeping motion of her arm across both areas, she asked, Whose arm is this then? Vakir, unfazed by her anger, calmly repeated her question and playfully grabbed her arm, saying, Mine, of course. His response left Camus blushing, her speech stumbling as she wondered why he had claimed her like that. Vakir couldn't resist teasing her further, adding, Who said you're mine? Much to her surprise, Vakir suddenly grabbed a nearby knife and brandished it, sending shockwaves through the onlookers. He smiled mischievously while showing the knife, clarifying, Only your arm belongs to me. The shocking display left both Hugo and Camus in disbelief. Fakir raised her arm high, seemingly ready to cut it with the knife. Camus couldn't hold back her tears and screamed for her uncle's help. Adolf swiftly appeared behind Fakir, his face contorted in anger, and sternly demanded, Get away from my niece! Now, Fakir reluctantly let go of her arm, allowing her to run to her uncle's protective embrace. Adolf turned his ire towards Hugo, demanding an explanation for the bizarre situation. Hugo remained silent, his gaze fixed on Fakir. Hugo sternly admonished Fakir, telling him that he had taken his joke too far. Fakir offered an apology, explaining that it was a common jest within their family and that the knife was merely a fake prop. Adolf was shocked to learn that such pranks were common among the twins, and Fakir bowed in remorse. Hugo then redirected the conversation, mentioning that he had some ideas regarding the ruby mines that Adolf should hear. 
He suggested that they should compete in friendly duels first. Camus couldn't resist a parting shot at Vakir, warning him to watch out and reminding him that she wouldn't forget his antics. Vakir simply smiled and nodded, seemingly unfazed by her threats. The friendly duels between the Baskervilles and Morgues commenced as planned. It was an event where children aged 8 to 15 gathered to battle it out. However, this year, everyone's attention was on the Morg clan versus the Baskerville clan, specifically Camus and Vakir. They were set to showcase their genius in a duel, following practical training rules. As the bells rang to announce the start of the duel, Camus assured Vakir that she wouldn't hold back and immediately began casting her spells. The crowd was left stunned as she engaged in quadra casting feet quite challenging for a 15-year-old. Adolf couldn't help but smile at Hugo, knowing that something extraordinary was unfolding. Camus unleashed her relentless attacks, but Fakir effortlessly dodged them, offering advice to focus on a single spell. Camus retorted, calling him an idiot who didn't understand magic, leaving the spectators in awe of the intense battle unfolding before them. As Vakir closed in on Camus, he summoned a stone wall, a defensive barrier, just in time. However, Vakir shattered it effortlessly, leaving Camus in shock, wondering if this was the true power of the Baskerville clan. The reference to the River Styx suggested the deep and unyielding strength of his attack. Camus closed her eyes momentarily, bracing herself for what was to come. When she opened them, Vakir was right there, extending his hand, and with a flick of his fingers, he sent her flying. This seemingly harmless flick surprised Adolf, who was taken aback by the unexpected force behind it. Meanwhile, Hugo chuckled at the situation. Kimu, puzzled by Vakir's actions, inquired about the flick, and wondered if he was taking it easy on Camus. Vakir pointed to his own forehead, indicating that hers might hurt, and suggested that they should end the duel before it escalated further. However, Camus ignored the advice and summoned two sand walls, laughing behind her defensive barriers. Vakir decided to play along and smash through the wall with his bare hands, catching Camus off guard. Vakir now questioned Camus about whose arm had crossed the wall, emphasizing his point by flicking her forehead again. He proclaimed himself the stronger individual with a smile as Camus fell once more, sporting a significant bump on her forehead. Camus angrily held her head and growled at him, threatening to kill him. As Vikir continued to dodge Camus' fire spells, he contemplated how to calm her down. He glanced behind, considering whether to let others handle the situation, as another duel was happening nearby, involving a pair of mages casting fire magic and a skilled swordsman adept at slicing through spells. Vakir saw potential in their abilities. Camus called out to Vakir, frustrated that he was avoiding her. She implored him not to turn away and to face her. Seizing the opportunity, the idiotic mage behind Vakir began chanting a powerful fire spell. Vakir warned Camus to have a defensive spell ready, and just as a massive fireball materialized behind him, Adolf yelled for her to prepare herself. Camus couldn't believe what was unfolding before her eyes. Adolf shouted for action, and a colossal explosion ensued. As the dust and smoke cleared, the onlookers gathered around the scene. They called out to Camus, fearing for her safety. She recognized her uncle's voice amidst the chaos and contemplated her next move. Camus managed to defend against the attack, but her clothes had been burned by the flames. She knew that once the smoke cleared, she would be the center of ridicule. In her mind, she pleaded for someone to help her, and to her surprise, a jacket landed on her head. Vakir stood before her, casually offering the jacket to cover herself. Camus questioned why he would help her, and Vakir simply replied that he wanted to. Camus couldn't help but wonder about his motives. Notably, she noticed that Vakir had been cut by the idiotic swordsman's attack, revealing his well-toned physique as the blood flowed from his wound. The crowd began to enter the smoke, realizing that Camus and Vikir were together. Adolf felt relieved that Camus was unharmed, while Hugo remained silent. The crowd recognized the contrast between Camus on the floor and Vikir, who appeared extremely fit due to his muscular physique, a testament to his rigorous training. Adolf held Camus tightly in his arms as she remained silent, her gaze fixed on him. Back at the mansion, Hugo approached Vakir, inquiring about his battle against the Lady of the Moor clan. Vakir explained that he had once again grasped the reason behind the event. Hugo pressed further, questioning why Vakir hadn't gone for a clear and decisive blow in the duel. Vakir admitted that he had been uncertain about how to deal with a lady in such a situation. Hugo, ever the stern mentor, told Vakir that he had let his guard down and that the wound on his arm should serve as a lesson. Vakir was taken aback by Hugo's unexpected concern. He recalled Hugo's past, marked by coldness, strictness, and brutality, stemming from the loss of his first wife and eldest daughter. However, Vakir brushed aside these thoughts, deeming them irrelevant. Hugo then shifted the conversation to the matter of the ruby mines. Vakir suggested that they should give them away. When Hugo asked for the reasoning behind this decision, Vakir explained that the primary purpose of the Baskerville clan was to expand its territories. The monsters and barbarians near the ruby mines posed a problem, 
and they could use the Morg clan to help deal with these issues, minimizing their losses during the expansion. Hugo agreed with Vakir's strategy, and Vakir elaborated that once the Morg clan claimed the ruby mines, they could simply push the monsters and barbarians into that region, allowing them to address all the problems at once. Hugo liked the idea of the rubies being stained with the blood of their enemies, which would deter the Morg clan from entering their territory. He affectionately rubbed Vakir's head, acknowledging that his idea was almost perfectly aligned with his own thoughts. However, Vakir couldn't help but think that the idea had originated from Hugo's past. Nevertheless, he agreed to keep an eye on the Morg clan's movements. Hugo assured him that he had already increased the number of hounds scouting the area for that purpose. As they continued walking, they encountered Adolf and Camus waiting for them. Adolf requested another conversation before they returned. Camus' blushing remained hidden behind her uncle. Back in the room, Hugo asked Adolf what they wanted to discuss. Adolf mentioned that he had another idea to address the issues surrounding the ruby mines, aside from paying for them. He suggested an engagement, an arrangement between the Morgue and Baskerville clans. Hugo inquired which child he had in mind for such an engagement. Adolf's proposal was clear. The eldest son of the Baskerville clan would be engaged to the eldest daughter of the Morgue clan. Camus. Adolf praised Camus, affirming that she was the best choice for such an arrangement. However, Hugo raised a concern, pointing out the substantial age gap between the eldest son, who was 25, and Camus, who was 17. Adolf dismissed this age gap as a non-issue, but Camus spoke out, declaring that she would not marry anyone weaker than her mother. Adolf attempted to convince Camus, suggesting that her medical condition might lead her to remain single for the rest of her life. However, Camus remained resolute in her stance. Hugo intervened, reminding her that this was not a matter of her choice alone. Camus asserted firmly that she had no intention of playing around and looked in a particular direction. Both Hugo and Adolf followed her gaze, and to their surprise, they found themselves staring at Vakir. Adolf whispered to Camus, urging her not to consider Vakir, emphasizing that he was just a small fish in a big pond and only bore the Van surname. Hugo overheard the comment and was slightly angered by it. He spoke out, emphasizing that an engagement should involve the consent of the individuals in question. Camus and Vakir maintained a silence as they locked eyes. Eventually, Vakir slowly opened his mouth and announced his acceptance of the engagement. Adolf, bewildered and somewhat angry at Vakir, was relieved to hear that the engagement was not rejected. Hugo assured Adolf that despite not bearing the Lu name, Vakir was a talented individual. Adolf stood in front of Vakir, sizing him up and trying to understand his motives. Vakir's memories of Adolf Morg flooded back. Adolf was a Sixth Circle master and one of the strongest members of the Morg clan, as well as a great supporter of his niece. Adolf questioned Vakir about his lack of response and the sturdiness of his body, seemingly puzzled by Vakir's demeanor and presence. Vakir responded to Adolf, admitting that he hadn't really been paying attention to what Adolf had said earlier. This response surprised Camus and even earned a light chuckle from Hugo. Adolf then asked Hugo for a chance to have a deeper conversation with Vakir. Hugo, in a somewhat amused tone, wondered if the Empire's mage was about to scold an eight-year-old child. Adolf clarified that it was a request as an uncle, and Kamu told Hugo that he didn't have to agree to this. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out at Blee768 who commented, Already read this god tier manhua, your recaps are also god tier though, so I'm gonna watch this anyway. On our unordinary video, thanks for commenting. However, Adolf gave Kamu a stern look and told her to stay put, explaining that this was something that was bound to happen to someone else eventually. He then requested Hugo's permission, and Hugo reluctantly agreed. Back at the training arena, Hugo and Camus stood on the sidelines while Adolf and Vakir prepared to face off in the arena. Adolf informed Vakir that they would be testing his abilities and wanted to see everything he was capable of. Vakir silently contemplated the opportunity to gauge Adolf's power and what he was truly capable of. He glanced at Hugo, knowing that his reasons for accepting the request were likely similar. Adolf cast a spell, creating a pot from a combination of fire, earth, and water magic leaving Camus in awe of his magical prowess. He explained to Vakir that they would duel with a pot of water on his head, and if a single drop fell, it would be Adolf's victory. Vakir remained silent, realizing that this challenge was an excellent way to understand Adolf's power. He also considered that Hugo had likely accepted the challenge for the same reason. The duel began as Adolf called out to Vakir to start. Vakir rushed towards Adolf, ready to strike with his sword. Camus was surprised by his aggressive approach and shouted out that he couldn't charge straight at his uncle. A bright light appeared on Vikir's face as a shield was cast to block the swing of his sword. Adolf questioned why Camus had given him that warning, and explained that shield magic was most effective against swordsmen. Vikir stepped back, annoyed by the turn of events. Adolf created fireballs in the air behind him, preparing to go on the offensive. 
He sent out flames towards Vakir, forcing him to leap back. Kamuk called out, accusing Adolf of being unfair for not using that magic against her in their duels. Adolf wondered which side she was on, while Hugo considered the attack something that wasn't impossible to dodge and chose not to intervene. Vikir, using his past knowledge and skills, believed he could make Adolf let his guard down and perhaps even defeat him. He struck the shield magic repeatedly, determined to break through. Adolf calmly informed him that it would be the same no matter how many times he attacked the shield as Vikir's sword would never pierce through it. As Vikir's sword struck the same spot repeatedly, cracks began to form, and Adolf couldn't help but acknowledge the impressive swordsmanship and machine-like precision in Vikir's movements. However, Vikir's sword was also showing signs of wear, and a final swing caused it to shatter into pieces. Adolf reminded Vikir that he should have considered the durability of his sword and shield. He emphasized that it's good to focus on a single goal, but it depends on the opponent. While Adolf was in the middle of his sentence, he noticed something unexpected. A piece of Vikir's shattered sword had pierced the pot on his head, causing water to flow down everywhere. Adolf was stunned to see this turn of events, and Vikir flexed in his own unique style. Camus fell even harder for Vikir, wondering if his victory against his uncle meant their marriage. Hugo, too, was pleased to see Vikir's growth and questioned if he had raised a stronger hound than he had initially thought. Fast forward seven years at the Baskerville training grounds, a massive furry beast with horns was growling wildly. Its loud roars shook the air around it, but the hound stood still, unafraid. The beast rushed towards them, causing the hounds to leap into the air and strike it. They surrounded the beast, and it retaliated by striking at all of them. Staffordshire Baskerville, the Shadow Hound, looked on, shouting commands and offering tips on how to defeat the beast. Suddenly, three hounds dashed forward, moving past everyone. These were the triplets, and they struck the beast with ease, their skills and dark crimson aura befitting the Baskerville family. The monster stood dazed from their attacks as the hounds seized the opportunity to prepare for the final kill. Blood splattered all over the ground, and the instructor praised them for their performance, declaring them low-rank sword experts. The instructor emphasized that this marked the end of their seven-year training. He warned that while they had faced a caged monster that day, the ones they would encounter in real life would be far more tenacious. He reminded them that death could occur more easily than they thought, offering two options, either use their bloodline to overcome challenges or build experience to survive. He saluted them, congratulated them on their graduation, and wished them luck in the future. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps. The graduates engaged in discussions among themselves about which order of the Baskerville family they wanted to join. The Baskervilles had seven distinct orders, each representing a different role, such as watching, searching, guarding, assassinating, suppressing, all-out warfare, and others. However, their attention soon turned to a particular individual, Vakir Van Baskerville. Vakir noticed that others were looking at him, likely due to the rumors that had circulated about him. It was said that he had slain a larger ox spear than the one they had faced during their training, and that he had already achieved a high rank as a sword expert. Vakir paid little heed to the gossip and thought to himself that his progress had taken longer than he had hoped. While he had reached an intermediate rank in the fifth Baskerville technique, Considering swordsmanship alone, he believed that he could have improved even more. Barrymore appeared, informing Vakir that the Patriarch was seeking him. Vakir greeted Barrymore and inquired about his well-being. He noticed a scar on Barrymore's nose and asked how it had happened. Hugo explained that he had obtained the scar while subjugating barbarians in the mountains, with one of the archers getting the better of him. Vakir asked if Hugo had captured them, but Hugo revealed that he had opted to leave the archer be and had returned the favor with a similar scar on the archer's face. Hugo congratulated Vikir, who wondered if the conversation would turn to the assignment. Vikir recalled his past life when he had been part of the Pitbull Order, sent away for 21 months to the Linwar Mountains, constantly engaged in battle. During that time, children in the family were divided. The expendable ones were sent to fight and die in battle, while the important ones were educated in politics and administration. This was why the fifth technique existed, allowing elite members to catch up to the expendable ones in terms of swordsmanship. Hugo called out to Vakir, suggesting that he try the lower house of parliament. Vakir was surprised by the suggestion, as the lower house was responsible for teaching about the politics and business of the Baskerville family. He couldn't believe that Hugo wanted him to take the elite course. Hugo praised Vakir for his achievements, acknowledging him as a genius and explaining that his position would be the deputy consul of the underdog city. Since both the consul and deputy consul positions were vacant, Hugo asked if Fakir would accept. Fakir agreed but mentioned that he had one thing to bring up. Fakir began discussing the incident with the Morgue clan over the ruby mines, 
and made a request as part of his reward. This request took Barrymore by surprise, and he reassured Hugo that if the request was too much, they could deny it. However, Hugo approved of Vakir's request, expressing his trust in him and believing that he wouldn't do anything foolish. Vakir accepted Hugo's trust, but still felt uncomfortable when Hugo referred to him as a son. As Barrymore and Vakir left the room, Barrymore confided in Vakir, revealing that Hugo deeply treasured him, which was why he hadn't immediately dispatched him into battle. Barrymore explained that this was a form of kinship between them. Vakir, however, maintained that such kinship only existed if he did a good job. He recalled his past memories of betrayal and death at Hugo's hands, feeling a deep hatred in his eyes as he promised that Hugo would experience the same sensation in this life. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. If you could time travel, would you go forward or backward in time? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now, back to the recap. The scene then shifted to a beautiful mansion, where a bald man instructed a pair of servants to ensure the mansion and its surroundings were squeaky clean by the next day. He mentioned that the new deputy consul from the Baskerville family would be arriving. The servants wondered what kind of person the new deputy would be hoping for someone experienced in business. As they conversed, Vikir walked by, catching their attention. One of the servants grabbed Vikir's shoulder, assuming he was a child and telling him that he couldn't just enter. Vikir responded sternly, instructing the servant to remove his hand and revealing a piece of paper to confirm his identity as the new deputy. Vikir then ordered the servants to prepare for a party with women and drinks, leaving them confused. Inside the building, people were enjoying drinks and food at the party, with laughter filling the air. One man, Chihuahua Baskerville, the general secretary of the city of Underdog, stared at the scene in disbelief. He was upset that Vakir was partying on his first day in the new role, especially after the previous deputy had caused trouble with bribes. Chihuahua expressed his frustration, shouting that Vakir was a troublemaker and that the city would only fall into ruin under his leadership. However, Vakir suddenly appeared behind him, asking if he was the general secretary. Chihuahua was puzzled about when Vakir had entered the room, and they introduced themselves to each other. Vakir observed something about Chihuahua's name, specifically the absence of a middle name. Chihuahua was stunned because he knew that lacking a middle name signified that he was an outsider from the family and had faced discrimination because of it. However, Vakir expressed that he found it nice, which confused Chihuahua. Vakir went on to explain that he had researched Chihuahua beforehand, and knew that he came from underdog. He claimed to understand the challenges people like Chihuahua had faced and assured him that he wouldn't interfere in his work, trusting him to do a good job. This left Chihuahua wondering if this was some form of harassment and why Vakir was here when he had requested a party. Closing a book he had been reading, Vakir stated that personal loss was not the issue, but the Judy Cow system had many flaws. This shocked Chihuahua as Vakir had read the book incredibly quickly. Vakir continued, addressing the problem of Underdog's numerous illegal businesses that were successful and held power above the law. He believed that merely shutting down these illegal businesses wouldn't solve the problem. The heads of these underground operations needed to be removed. Chihuahua remained silent as Vakir explained further, gazing out the window and stating that the deputy council's job was to make and execute laws. He expressed his respect for the existing laws, but proposed the need for a new law. Chihuahua asked why they needed a new law, and Vakir replied that he intended to dismantle the underground economy within a week, but required a legitimate reason to do so. As a newly appointed deputy council member, he needed a convincing performance to achieve this. In other words, he would lay out the bait to catch the flies. Chihuahua stared at Vakir, unsure of his intentions for the city. The following day, on Dort Smile Street in downtown Underdog, a crowd had gathered. Vakir stood before them, dressed impeccably, with servants and Chihuahua standing behind him. The onlookers wondered what a young child could possibly do, and why he had been standing there since dawn. Vakir introduced himself as the newly appointed deputy council, and drew the crowd's attention to a notice behind him, explaining that the laws had been in place for some time, and would continue to be upheld, even with a change in leadership. However, the crowd didn't believe him, thinking that the higher-ups wouldn't take any action, and they expected lobbying to begin soon. Chihuahua, frustrated with their skepticism, yelled at the crowd to mind their manners and reminded them that Vakir came from the main Baskerville family. As the crowd continued to mock Vakir, he remained silent, gripping the stick tightly in his hand. Suddenly, he raised the stick high above his head and slammed it forcefully into the ground, creating a shockwave of surprise among the onlookers. After releasing the stick, Vakir announced a special law with the authority of the Deputy Council. Vakir Special Law, Section 1, Class 1. He declared a reward of 100 million hold to anyone who could remove the stick. The crowd was left in stunned silence, 
Unable to believe what they had just witnessed, they collectively shouted, What? into the air, struggling to comprehend the new law Vakir had created. Chihuahua and the servants remained silent, while the crowd began discussing the substantial reward offered. Vikir called out to the crowd, questioning if there was anyone willing to take the money. Still, no one stepped forward. In response, he increased the reward amount. However, someone from the crowd laughed and called it ridiculous, accusing Vikir of making fun of them. The crowd agreed, urging Vikir to stop fooling around and go to sleep. Chihuahua wondered why they were the ones feeling embarrassed by the situation. Vakir remained silent in the face of their remarks and asked again if there was anyone willing to try. He increased the reward once more, emphasizing that whoever could pull up the stick would receive the new reward. He scanned the crowd, disappointed that no one had come forward. Chihuahua whispered something to Vikir, mentioning that the city didn't have that amount of money. Amidst the skeptical crowd, a small hand was raised. A young girl with a snot on her nose and carrying a basket of flowers asked if she could try. A man in the crowd cautioned her not to do it, fearing for her safety. But she explained that her mother was sick and she needed to try something to help. The girl smiled and told the crowd that if anything happened to her, they should take good care of her mother. The old man was left speechless as the brave girl stood before Vikir in the stick, thinking that perhaps Vikir wouldn't harm her and that they might reward her with a few coins for volunteering to make herself a fool. Encouraged by Vikir's instruction, the young girl with the basket full of flowers bent down and held the stick tightly, pulling with all her might. To her surprise, the stick came out easily, and a look of astonishment crossed her face. The crowd was equally surprised to witness her success. Holding the stick, the little girl looked up at Vakir, wondering why it had been so effortless for her. Vakir released a red aura, causing the girl to tear up and close her eyes, fearing that she might be executed for some unknown reason. She worried about who would look after her mother if she were executed. However, instead of harm, a bag appeared in front of her. Fakir knelt down in front of the girl and told her to take the bag of reward money. She held the bag in confusion, and the crowd was equally baffled by the unexpected turn of events. Fakir glanced back at Chihuahua and asked the girl where her home was, assuring her that the remaining money would be sent to her with a guard to protect it. He affectionately rubbed her head and emphasized the importance of obeying the law. The citizens were once again shocked as the bag of money revealed a collection of gold coins. With the assurance that the new deputy would uphold the laws, the citizens were filled with happiness, and even crime rates were significantly reduced. Vikir praised Chihuahua's handwriting and mentioned that he had never been touched in the past 20 years of his work. Chihuahua expressed his willingness to follow Vikir for the rest of his days, and Vikir urged him to calm down. However, the truth was that the act the young girl had just performed was originally meant to be carried out by Kamu in the future. Due to the citizens' fear and dislike of Kamu, it had fallen to Vakir to take her place. Vakir unrolled a map and pointed out that the city's problems were only just beginning. Since they had used up their money for the reward, they needed a way to replenish their funds. He marked out locations where illegal groups were operating and where they might hide their ill-gotten gains in the future, intending to confiscate their dirty money. Chihuahua stared at the map, wondering how Vakir knew the whereabouts of these criminal businesses. Vakir responded to Chihuahua's inquiry by saying that he could smell the illegal activities but it was particularly acute due to his regression. Chihuahua admired Vikir for investigating this much already and saw him as a flawless man. As a man opened the door, he informed them that the Young Autonomy Association had requested a meeting, which was exactly what Vikir had expected. Chihuahua explained that the group consisted of members from several clans and was essentially a social club for the young masters who believed they were above the law. They had something to say about Vakir's special law. Vakir told Chihuahua that the dung flies had started to smell and showed a sly grin, indicating that they might need to take action against the pests that were eating away at the city. Meanwhile, within a high-end hotel in Underdog City called Burning Suspension, a party was underway. The attendees were the seven crucial members of the Youth Autonomy Association, representing the second and third generations of the seven families within the Baskerville Territory. They discussed their lavish lifestyle and how their money kept replenishing thanks to the Baskerville's territorial expansion. They openly spoke about kidnapping barbarians to sell as slaves and how the Baskervilles were like their personal hunting dogs. The blonde man among them referred to the Baskervilles as idiots with swords and blamed them for the destruction of the loyal Mesa Madinaro clan, which had led to the association's current dominance. They decided to have some fun with Vikir, planning to bring him to the club throw an extravagant and expensive party, and then make him foot the bill afterward, all while pretending it was a joke to deter him from bothering them. A servant entered the room, bringing out female escorts, but one of them noticed Vakir and questioned if someone had ordered a male escort. Enraged by the insinuation, Vakir grabbed the servant by the hair 
His eyes filled with anger. A loud snapping sound echoed in the room, leaving the servant's arm in a grotesque shape. He screamed in pain, leaving the other members shocked and bewildered by what had just happened. Fakir made his presence known to the members of the Youth Autonomy Association, causing them to realize who he was. They nervously greeted him while whispering among themselves about whether they should proceed with their plan. Fakir placed his hand on the table, instructing them to stop their pointless chatter. He released a red aura, grabbing their attention and causing glasses to shake and the champagne tower to vibrate and finally explode. It became evident that he used mana manipulation to make the tower explode, showcasing his graduator class abilities at the age of 15. The members continued to whisper among themselves, shocked by Vakir's power. They called him out for the drinks they had ordered, but Vakir leaned in, questioning if they intended to make him pay for everything. The members tried to calm him down, explaining that they were merely testing him and highlighting the city's corruption. Vakir responded by striking one of them in the stomach with his fingers, causing severe bleeding. He chastised them for their trust and warned that they had never encountered true fear. He threw the injured man to the floor and stepped on his face. As the others protested, Vakir explained that they would soon understand his intentions. The members, still defiant, called Vakir a bastard and believed he wouldn't get away with his actions. Vakir then listed their various crimes, including abduction, kidnapping, illegal slave trafficking, and insulting the Baskervilles, among others. He smacked one of the guys in the face, asserting that animals needed to be taught lessons. With a sadistic smile and glowing eyes, Fakir told them that they were about to witness what he could do to teach disobedient creatures a lesson in the deep underground dungeon. Fakir and Chihuahua stood in front of a prison cell, looking at something inside with disgust. A hand reached out from the cell bars, and a man inside threatened Fakir, saying that he would tell his father everything and that he wouldn't survive after pulling such a stunt. The man was the blonde one from the Youth Autonomy Association, and he vowed to get out of there and kill Vikir. Chihuahua asked Vikir why he had ordered such a severe beating for the man and his associates. Vikir questioned if he thought it was too much, to which Chihuahua expressed his concern about turning people into meat bags. However, Vikir told him that he hadn't even started yet and approached the cell. Vikir explained to the prisoners that the village hall was meant to manage wicked individuals, but it had turned into a hideous organization. He believed that, judging by their arrogant expressions, they lacked proper education. Vikir shocked them further by stating that he would execute them all once the sun had set, leaving the blonde man in disbelief. Chihuahua urged Vikir not to go through with it, as their family would retaliate, but Fakir assured him that their crimes were tied to the criminals of Underdog City, and he had his ways of handling things. This confused Chihuahua, and he questioned Fakir's intentions. Fakir then listed the charges against the prisoners, including human trafficking, kidnapping, bribery, blackmail, threats, and murder. The blonde man claimed they were innocent, but Fakir challenged them to accept punishment if there was evidence. He stared at them intensely, mentioning they looked guilty but had no proof. Just then, a man entered carrying a bag covered in blood with a knife sticking out. The man informed Fakir that his custom order was ready. Fakir thanked him for the great timing and revealed the gruesome tools inside the bag. The man asked Fakir where he got the ideas for such scary tools but Fakir brushed it off as common tools from where he came from, the era of destruction. Fakir removed his jacket, revealing the tools, which frightened the blonde man. Fakir asked the prisoners where their defiant expressions had gone and reminded them of their previous refusal to admit anything, no matter what. Viker rolled up his sleeves, signaling his intent to relive his cherished memories from his past. Rumors began to spread throughout the town about the arrest of the seven members of the Youth Autonomy Association. People in town discussed the situation, speculating on what the new deputy would do. Some believed he would release them, while others thought he might execute them, but most assumed it was merely a political power play between the new and old politicians. As the citizens predicted the outcome, the seven influential families sent an apology to the new deputy council. They used their local influence to secure the prisoner's release and have the new deputy punished by the patriarch. However, instead of the expected punishment, something shocking occurred. The severed heads of the seven family heads were displayed in the center square, preserved with salt and contorted in expressions of agony. A notice behind the heads detailed their crimes and execution. The citizens were left speechless and stunned by this gruesome sight. Vakir explained to Chihuahua that this outcome was anticipated, and it marked the beginning of significant changes in the city. He warned Chihuahua to prepare for what would follow, as this display would likely lead to bloodshed in the underdog city. Chihuahua was uncertain about his role in this unfolding plan, especially since he was now wearing a mask. He questioned whether this strategy was the right one. A figure nearby asked him if he didn't trust Vikir, but Chihuahua remained unsure about the plan's effectiveness. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of the underdog city, an unlawful slave auction was taking place, 
A man welcomed attendees to the event, surprised to see members of the Matt Blanc clan. He inquired if they were there to sell slaves and questioned Chihuahua's dissatisfaction with the previous slaves they had bought. Chihuahua, under the guise of the mask, assured the man that they were there to sell and agreed to part with Vakir, who had distinctive features like red eyes and black hair, expecting a good price. He hopes that Chihuahua has a good time at the circus. The auction begins in the main ten as night falls. The people discuss about the slaves that were popular and what they wanted to buy as the clown man tells them that an item was secretly embezzled by the Baskerville family's knights. It was an A-rank monster that is said to have 19 hearts, the Mercy L from its leather meat bones and intestines. Nothing goes to waste the price starts at 100 million gold. The price increases till the prize was sold for 250 million gold. The auction continues as the people bid and buy things. A man approaches Clown Mask as he was surprised they were going to sell something this time. He announces to everyone that something special has arrived and was found deep within the jungle. It was the Barbarian of Balak from the warrior tribe in the Lorange Mountain jungles. He tells them they would get a different feeling when they tame a wild slave and it would be the perfect chance to test their slave training techniques. But he wonders why they had decided to sell this thing. He calls out for a bid no one responses. He then decides to lower the bid from 5 to 1 million, but still the people were not interested. He tells the huge man to get rid of it as no one wanted it, but the warrior struggles to free itself, so the huge man punches her hard, making her unconscious. He apologies for the disturbance as they bring her to the back. As an apology, he decides to bring out the best product they had today. Vikir made a dramatic entrance capturing the attention of everyone at the slave auction. He wore a disguise with long hair, donning the clown mask. The masked clown introduced him as a rare item with black hair and red eyes, setting the stage for an extravagant sale. Bidding started at 600 million gold, quickly escalating as participants vied for the unique item. The price reached 900 million, but then a single bid raised it to a staggering 6 billion. Everyone in the room was stunned by this astronomical figure. The bidder was identified as Baron Gambino from the Granary, a man who had gained immense wealth and power in the underground. A lady accompanying him expressed concern about the exorbitant price, but Gambino assured her that he could sell Vikir at an even higher price in the capital. He scolded her for speaking out of turn warning her not to bite the hand that fed her. The masked clown asked if there were any other bidders, but no one dared to challenge Gambino's offer. Vikir approached Gambino, who found him intriguing up close. Gambino tried to reassure Vikir that he wasn't a bad man, all the while panting heavily from his excitement. However, Vikir suddenly raised his arms and pulled the chain with incredible force, breaking it swiftly. This shocking display left both the lady and Gambino stunned. Vakir then lifted his foot and stomped the ground, sending Gambino flying into the air. Gambino landed hard on the ground, writhing in pain. Vakir stood over him, grabbing his back and taunting him, asking if he wanted to play the game of shield and spear. He squeezed Gambino so hard that he began to bleed, leaving a lasting impression on everyone at the auction. Vakir revealed his true identity to the shocked crowd at the circus after subduing Baron Gambino. He acknowledged that the name Circus suited the place well, and warned everyone that they wouldn't leave in one piece. Vakir's presence stunned the onlookers, and he removed his disguise to show himself as Vikir van Baskerville. The clown mask, still unable to believe Vikir's appearance, ordered his guards to kill him, thinking that Vikir was unarmed. However, Vikir had Belzebub's skill, and he easily dispatched the guards with swift and precise strikes. The clown mask noticed the eerie red aura surrounding Vikir, and realized they were dealing with a formidable adversary. Meanwhile, Chihuahua was surprised by Vakir's incredible strength, but noticed something else happening. The clown mask tried to get Vakir to surrender, using Chihuahua's life as leverage, but Vakir remained resolute and silent. Chihuahua, despite being in a dire situation, expressed his unwavering loyalty to Vakir and his refusal to compromise with injustice. Vakir praised Chihuahua's loyalty, and assured him that he had a plan. Vakir then revealed a whistle given to him by the Patriarch and blew it, creating a sharp and wild noise that stunned everyone in the room. The clown mask chuckled nervously, thinking nothing had happened, but soon, something unexpected occurred. A figure appeared behind the clown mask and he suddenly fell to the ground. Chihuahua screamed as the figure swiftly struck down the clown mask with his blade. As the crowd screamed in shock, another man attempted to attack the mysterious figure, but he, too, met a gruesome end, sliced into pieces. Vakir remained calm and smiling throughout the chaos, leaving the audience terrified and bewildered by his power and the sudden turn of events. As chaos ensued in the circus, a group of hooded and armed men entered the room. Their mere presence silenced the crowd, and Cindy recognized them as the Annihilation Experts, the Empire's brutal night order, 
or the Pitbull Knight Order as the Baskerville clan referred to them. These experts were all graduators, and their arrival struck fear into the hearts of those present. Cindy and the guards began to realize the gravity of the situation, but before any harm could come to her, Vakir intervened, ordering the Pitbulls to leave her alone. They obeyed his command, and Vakir instructed them to deal with the rest of the people who weren't already lying down. The Pitbull Knights carried out Vakir's orders, brutally dispatching those who posed a threat. The Pitbull's ruthlessness reflected the clan's military power, something that Hugo had been sensitive about. The massacre continued, and one man contemplated trying to escape once things quieted down, but a Pitbull spotted him. When he suggested that they handcuff him, the Pitbull explained that they didn't use handcuffs. Instead, they severed the legs of those they captured. After the carnage, a man wearing sunglasses, the commander of the Pitbull Knights, Boston Terrier Labaskerville, approached Vakir. He acknowledged Vakir's potential and offered to have him join the Pitbull Knights to be trained properly. Vakir said he would think about it, but quickly dismissed Boston when he mentioned having urgent matters to attend to. Vakir entered a room filled with various cages, and he knew what he was looking for must be there. Among the cages, he noticed a safe containing the money that nobles had paid for the slaves, which would later be taxed by the city hall. However, his attention was drawn to a specific cage where he found a female barbarian who was moaning in pain and covered in wounds. Vakir was angered by her torment and offered her a red and blue potion from his waist, telling her he was giving it to her out of kindness. She drank the potion, and her wounds miraculously healed. The barbarian girl was surprised and grateful for Vikir's help. Vikir spoke to the barbarian girl in her language, urging her to go and pointing to the exit. Despite his limited knowledge of her language, she responded with a string of words that Vikir couldn't understand. Before leaving, she turned back to Vikir and spoke once more in her language, which Vikir assumed was a thank you. After ensuring her escape, Vikir resumed his search and found what he had come for, the Marshal's corpse that had been auctioned earlier. Belzebub, his demonic companion, became active and loudly expressed its hunger. Vakir instructed Beelzebub to quickly consume the corpse before the Pitbull Knights arrived. Rumors of the events at the circus spread throughout the town, with reports of nobles and participants being taken to the underdog city prison with their limbs torn off. The entire club burning suspension had burnt down, and the heads of its VIP members were put on display. This served to raise awareness of criminal activities in the city. The seven families who had lost their children sent letters of protest to the administrative office, but the response they received was uncompromising. The Baskerville family had found evidence of the Imperial family's involvement in illegal slave trading and would report it to the Imperial family. The seven family patriarchs came and knelt before the Kier, offering apologies and begging for mercy, but their assets were confiscated and three generations of each family were to be destroyed for their treason. The execution ground was filled with the blood of the city's corrupt individuals, which garnered the love of the citizens. Crime rates dropped, and employment opportunities increased, restoring the welfare of Underdog City. The next day, Chihuahua approached Fakir with a smile, bringing him coffee as a sign of gratitude for saving him from the clown mask. Fakir, however, dismissed the gesture and urged Chihuahua to focus on his duties. Chihuahua brought Fakir coffee with added sugar, creamer, and a little water, attempting to sweeten his mood. Vakir then inquired about Chihuahua's progress in transcribing, and Chihuahua complimented Vakir's writing skills. Though Vakir humbly acknowledged he still had much to learn, Chihuahua was impressed with Vakir's ability to create new laws and comprehend legal knowledge quickly, believing that Underdog City would develop even further with Vakir's presence. As night fell and moonlight streamed through the bars, a person handcuffed and blindfolded was brought to Vakir. He apologized to the person revealed her identity as Sydney, and asked her why he had spared her life. Vakir wanted to ask her some questions and promised to let her go if she answered honestly. When Vakir asked if she thought he had been enforcing the law effectively, Sydney, though upset, reluctantly replied that he was doing well. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out at Blee768, who commented, Best channel FR on our unordinary video. Thanks for commenting. Vakir approached her, raised her face close to his, and questioned her intently, making her nervous and causing her to tremble. She hesitated, but eventually explained that while his laws had reduced crime, they would lead to suffering and resentment among the citizens in the long term. She also warned that the Baskerville family might not welcome him gaining too much power in Underdog City as it could threaten their authority. Sidney listens to Vakir's explanation and advice, acknowledging the potential consequences of his actions and the hatred he might face from both the people and the Baskerville family. She suggests that he return the power and achievements to the clan leader, 
hide his powers by going to the Lunar Mountain or the Empire's Academy, and allow the clan leader to take the blame when the time comes. Fakir contemplates her words but soon unleashes his powerful aura, known as Hound Shadow, causing her to feel immense pressure. However, she stands by her advice, suggesting that it might be the only way for him to avoid being hated. Fakir, with a smile, agrees that he will keep her advice in mind. He frees her from her handcuffs and she prepares to leave, expressing her hope that he won't regret their encounter. Before she goes, Vakir asks her if she is familiar with the Mesa Madinaro clan. Hearing the name makes her stop in her tracks. Vakir recounts the tragic history of the Mesa Madinaro clan, once a wealthy merchant clan that fell victim to an unfortunate incident. The young master of the clan had unknowingly demonstrated the secret Baskerville sword techniques at his birthday celebration, leading to the clan's destruction by the Baskerville family's hunting dogs. Cindy, puzzled, asks what this story has to do with her. Vikir continues, revealing that there was a survivor from the Mesa Marinaro clan, a one-year-old girl who was spared because of her beauty. She had endured unspeakable torture at the hands of the young members of the Seven Families, and her fate was horrifying even to Vikir, who couldn't bear to describe it in detail. Cindy, overwhelmed by Vikir's revelations, grits her teeth and tries to leave, expressing her reluctance to hear more. However, Vakir insists that there's more to the story. He describes how a new deputy arrived in the city, managing to unearth the city's old problems and administer proper punishments. The catalyst for these changes was the seven members of the idiotic group who had triggered a series of events. The new deputy ensured that the seven wrongdoers were thoroughly tortured, and they eventually confessed to their crimes, uttering apologies as they met their gruesome end. This revelation leaves Cindy in tears, and she angrily questions who those apologies were directed towards given the torment they had inflicted on her and her clan. Vakir calmly responds that the apologies were meant for the young girl known by the fake name Cindy Nissan Rose, the sole survivor of the Mesa Madinaro clan. Cindy finds it difficult to believe Vakir's words, especially considering the torture he mentions. In response, Vakir takes her to a particular cell, urging her to see for herself. Inside, Cindy is confronted with a horrifying scene. The walls and bodies are covered in blood. Words are scrawled on the floor in blood, and the seven criminals have confessed their crimes and asked for forgiveness in their dying moments. The sight overwhelms Cindy, and she vomits in response. Fakir walks up to her, explaining that there is still one clan left to hate, the Baskerville clan, and she has every right to do so. Cindy, wiping her mouth, questions why Fakir is helping her despite being a member of the Baskerville clan. Fakir cryptically responds that she's asking the wrong question, and Cindy eventually understands his unspoken message. She promises to repay this debt to him, and ensures that he will never have to worry about money in the future. The next day at the mansion, Chihuahua is shocked to find blood and dead bodies in the room when he greets Vakir good morning. Vakir, seemingly unfazed, wakes up and returns the greeting, leaving Chihuahua baffled and concerned about the gruesome scene. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps.